Okay, so um, Jacob has been patiently waiting <laughs> all week to give his talk, uh, but by having it now, he's had time to relax after running scarce last week in, in Inchon. And we're delighted to have him tell us about the key opportunities for Baden Bars Thank you. Can you hear me on the Zoom? Uh, no, you've got to share the screen. I think I did. Yes. Yes, that's good. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you, Pierce. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be back in London. Uh, as Pierce said, uh, when I had an email uh, from Pierce to come to London, I was in the middle of a crisis <laughs> organizing conference in, in, in Incheon last week. <laughs> and as, as any organizer for big meeting, the only thing I, I, I you know, obsessed about was actually the number of people because that basically translate my budget, once I secure the enough number, then I concerns about programs. And I there was a few people I had in my mind, you know, how to orchestrate all things. I started to think for him, and then I tried to negotiate with Pierce that if I accept the invitation to London, he will come to intern, but in that, in the end, he, he decided to you know, assist when he's a former student, and we had a lovely you know, assist, uh, meeting. And the meeting actually went well, actually, with 864 people from okay. Slurdy. Country and that was fantastic. So my talk today, oh by the way, I'm based in Seoul, uh, but I have sort of the you know, this uh, three-year visiting uh, position in, in Bangalore. It's kind of Korean Indian connection. So my, my position in India is put by info of the foundation, but all my work is in Korea, funded by Korea National Foundation and Samsung Foundation in Samsung Electronics. After high octane talk by Pablo, uh, I, I I probably dial down a little bit and, and slow down. I don't know what it means. Actually, you, you'll ask less question. We'll see. Uh, the other one is uh, be one that there won't be any more except for one slide. So everything about very very simple uh, system. And the system is. Uh, uh, we yeah deliberately uh choose a magnet okay but unlike graphene the you can't actually have monolayer magnet unless you design engineer uh therefore what we have is actually is is a naturally occurring material like nickel ps3 but the all the game i might i like to play is actually with nickel there are some elements of physics with phosphorus and sulfur, but everything I, I, I you know, have in mind is a nickel network. And it is about the, so the, the I'm not quite sure how many of you know this field, but the Van der Waals magnet has been expanded quite a lot. There are many exciting the results, but for the sake of your interest, I, I understand you come from very diverse background and so you, probably will benefit from understanding what's going on in one particular system, and that probably help you to expand your understanding. So I decided to choose the nickel PS3 analysis because I'm more interested in this nickel PS3, but it also kind of the you know, is uh, captured all the you know, things going on in this field. So these are the bundlers, just like the graphene's, uh, and, and the, you can produce you know, it's a very thin sample using uh, various techniques, including scotch tapes. And this sample we produced about six or seven years ago on top of silicon and nine pixel silicon dioxide. And initial sort of our product was a barely 10 micron wide monolayer, but now we can go for bigger than that. Uh, and the, my talk will, is about how, what science we can explore or technology we can explore actually. 
I won't tell you much about the technology, uh, not least because it is, I have limited time. So physics is more interesting for all of us. So I, I'll probably uh, focus on physics, but if you ask me this, I will say something about uh, application too. Okay, I have trouble. Hmm. Okay. Right. Okay. Probably I cannot actually. Right. Okay. Uh, so there is an element of a connection with London, actually. Uh, I like to you know, see, come back to London ever since I came to London in 1990 to the PhD at Imperial College, uh, together with my supervisor, late Brian Cox. And three years under him, actually, can feel the deep love of a material and deep love for magnesium. And it all began from that uh, three-year experience with him. So when I was a student, I made a lot of samples. Uh, basically, yes, I'm supposed to make a sample, bring the sample to the ISO or ILA. In those times, there is no license for uranium. So I made a depleted uranium compounds, about 30 grams, and put in my pocket or my bags and travel to tra on the train or flight. Uh, the train to Changdaman never actually you know, caught me, uh, so I was okay. So there was a kind of joke among, among the young people. You know, see, young people always hide of something very, very unusual things, right? The pride I had more shared with my colleague was the rule of thumb. So I don't know whether, how many of you heard about the rule of thumb. So neutron scattering is actually intensely hungry again. It's, it's, uh, there is nothing, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, enough neutrons wherever you go, even in SNS or ISIS, even at the brand new machine at ESS. So we need, you need a big sample. How big sample is, is another matter. Rule of thumb is you need a sample as big as your thumb, okay? Uh, that is the rule. Uh, so rule of thumb, which is not much accurate, appreciated by many my colleagues uh, working on, you know, it's an imperial at those time, David Kathleen's group was working on ITC. There was a tiny, tiny sample. I, I, was, I was only one, you know, so having big, big sample, 30 gram. Uh, you're not fortunate enough to have that big sample, at least in this case, six gram of mangan street chin single crystal. If you have, then you have a luxury of you know, it's a exploring whole spin wave in brilliant John. Then you come down to California. Okay. It's very, very uh initially I really like, but then looking back, it's kind of an anti-climax. You you grow the six gram or 30 gram sample, in the end of the day, you know, it's, it's Indeed, in the train experiment each day, you know, Andrew Taylor of Jack of Isis often joked that you know, one day for you, uh, cost Isis about 10,000 pounds, make best use of that, right? Okay. And then you have, you know, often, you know, it's, it's uh, in early days, you usually megabyte, but now it's, it's often terabyte data. The end of the day, the, all the Hamilton you care about, two dimension. I thought this is anti climate, right? <laughs> uh, nevertheless, there was a you know, this uh, sort of you know, this uh, <laughs> my life. Uh, but some point in my career, I I I began to question myself. You, know, you spent all your career making samples three dimensional and spend weeks of in time, uh, gigabyte terabyte data, and coming down to two dimension. But sample is really three dimensional. Okay. We actually measured the uh, nickel PSC for the reason I'm going to tell you later. So nickel PSC from the rust material is very hard to have six gram sample. So my student painstakingly collected all the sample, about 50 sample called line. And we went to SNS, which is uh, one of the most intense neutron facilities, spending about weeks and then collected all the data. And then we made a beautiful analysis together with Alan Shi and Alan Tan and, and US. I'll come back to that point. 
we still don't you know, see two you know, neutron scattings. Uh, but the, this is really you know, it's annoying. You, know, so you have three dimensions, but at the end of the day, you only use two dimensions. Okay? So I came to the idea. I like just like to have two dimensions, okay? two dimensional material. What, what the hell? You, know, so you, have, you always come care about two dimensional Hamiltonian, then two dimensional material will be fun. Okay? Yeah? So are you sure that there's no um, along the I come to, I, I come to that There is a so to give you a, in a sense of you know says energy scale. So in plane is basically covalent bonding. So you have usually J of a milli millimeter order, but in the plane the bandwidth interaction. So usually ten or hundred times smaller weak interaction. But that interaction is quite crucial to establish uh, in a macroscopic phase emission. Right. Uh, so, uh, as, as Paolo said yesterday, I'll probably take some colloquial style for my talk uh, mm -hmm. to give you, share the sum of you know, this initial frustration, idea, and excitement with you uh, before going into more tricky case of you know, uh, uh, scientific you know, uh, result on nickel PS3 on the three things technique dependent magnetism, correlation, and magnetic action. And then I'm going to end my talk with Paolo and so I guess uh, probably all of you learned this, uh, you know, this fundamental pillar of, of modern well, physics, it's not the condenser matter, which is Hamiltonian. Again, they are all two dimensions. Okay? And this is a kind of you know, bread and butter, although you not really appreciate you know, the wisdom we, we learned from this uh, Hamiltonian. Obviously, you know, it's, it's, I'm not that capable of, of doing the BKT or Minimum wagner, but at least I remember when I was a student at the Seoul National University, and uh, I spent the two weeks of my you know, this, uh, you know, st statistical mechanical course solving these on cycle solution by transfer matrix. Mm -hmm. uh, at least that was you know, this hardcore, you know, this uh, theory oriented in a Seoul National University style you know, trainings for experimentalists, uh, <laughs> but we had endured, right, okay? We still <laughs> proud of training our students in this up to the high level of theory. Uh, and, and that was a kind of you know, interesting point. And that theory done by Lars Onsaga was published in 1943. When I was a student in 1987, I spent two weeks of my lecture with my university you know, lecturers and learning that technique. And, and people like me coming from Asia, you know, the Go game is, is, is one of popular you know, pastime, you know, is, uh, you know, thing. I'm not really, you know, is, is good at Go, but nevertheless, you know, this simple image of this, uh, you know, on server solution is nothing other than black and white. Okay. So if you have black and white, you know, say lattice, and you vary the parameter like pressure, or sorry, the, the field or temperature, and just see that, you know, it's a density of you know, it's a blackness, whiteness, just content. The ratio is kind of for the parameter as simple as that. You can solve that problem using transfer matrix. Well, you may not care, but the people like me, the experimentalists, you know, the image is very important. And so one day I talked about you know, it's, it's these image, mental image, being able to measure the order parameter on the microscope. Okay? And at that point, you know, it's, it's uh, having big training on theory and people talks about these things done years ago. I had extremely biased that believing that there was some experimental result supporting this theory. And, and that kind of, you know, soul searching led me to this particular paper by Mose Chan and Han Gu Kim, his former student, who came back to Korea, published in 1984. When I started my undergraduate, and basically they measure wetting the wetting of you know this uh, 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 you know CH four on top of graphite, and they found the the critical exponent of this uh, phase transition belong to iodine class. Okay, and and I, I guess this is most beautiful experiment. Right? Okay, uh, and then I try to really search hard, right? You know, it's for the Paper work done using magnetic material on 2D. Okay. That actually took me a lot of trouble with my 
seniors and, and my friends. And the claim they made was all those things done in 70s, 60s, et cetera. And, well, there is nothing new you can learn new. And that's probably true. I didn't anticipate that by doing this experiment, I'm going to make new discovery on Onsago solution. I guess that will be probably the craziest idea. But nevertheless, I really frustrate that. You know, it's, it's, uh, Onsago solution is one of the most fundamental theorems. Yet, uh, with that theorem, you can basically imagine using magnetic material, yet there is no experimental data reported on this beautiful theorem, really frustrating. So I argued in this, so with, with my, a lot of colleagues uh, back and forth. And in the end, I, I, I kind of in this, uh, agreed that it has been an attempt, or the still going attempt using MD, PLD, et cetera, in 70s and 60s, that all these things actually not through 2D. This is quasi 2D or 3D. And only recently, we now know that people can grow oxide monolayer using PLD and MDA if you have very fancy MDA or PLD. So bottom line is, although this physics is, is so novel and elegant, there is no experimental result using true magnetic material. That was my starting point, okay? After a few years, you know, this uh, to be in discussion, hot and, and units. Uh, and and obviously my 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 idea inspired by or actually frustrated by graphenes. So in, in around two thousand five and six, actually Philip often come back to Korea, gave talk on graphene, etc. And everyone around me seemed to be doing something about graphene. Okay, and in neutron scatter, there is nothing else you can do with neutrons with graphene, right? Okay. Uh, and that was frustration. I really wanted to do something about this particular physics, but not with graphene. The idea was if I can make some kind of you know, this, uh, magnetic version of graphene, which I call the magnetic graphene, then there can be something I can do. I can understand the language. And that was basically the starting point. I was so crazy. And I also frustrated yes, period. So, so uh, you, you still want to do neutron spectrum? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I basically sketched my idea in a, in a, in a short paper, basically. Yeah. And, and the idea is very, very simple. The everything I care about is uh, magnetism can boil down to one parameter, which is how about you? And the idea, if you have, how about the physics on, on two dimensions where you have extremely large location, quantum, and spatial, whatever, then I guess there may be something in the corner of phase diagram which we never saw before, and that is going to enrich our, our, our physics. That was a very simple idea. And the search for the real material, obviously, I started with some three dimensional materials like oxide. Layered compounds, beautiful. If you take TM, layered compound, you try to, you know, it's, it's a break. Sometimes you can, but covalent bonding is, is extremely strong. So there is no chance you can actually break that bonding at E, right? Okay, so that is hard lesson I learned. Like right? if someone is trying to play hand, no, okay. So it, we basically waste up couple of years actually my student and post sex time and, and before just you know see pressing stop button of a project uh, usually I wait and and and, and in, in some reason uh you know it's a, or another I suddenly remember the paper I read when I was a postdoc in Grenoble uh and that paper actually is written by Raymond de Brack he's famous in organic chemist from Nantes in, in, in France. And this is beautiful review paper on layered compound. In, in 80s, you know, there is a lot of you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, search for material, you know, it's, it's a layered compound like the Zong and, 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 and Lehman Brack in all the inorganic chemistry, probably because listen bad to it. Since aside, a lot of layered compound, in this particular compound, he discussed these transition metal phosphor trisulfide. It's a beautiful uh, uh, review, state of art back then, 
he basically, you know, he, 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 he gave all the information I needed. And moreover, these system forms a honeycomb. And if you just plot the you know, crystal structure on sideways, you see that there is huge vanderized gap. Okay. And that was the moment I realized, actually, I was looking for something completely wrong. You know, it's, it's, you never be able to break the oxide bond, but at least find the virus 10 or 20 times smaller. We have some chance. And, and luckily, I had a very you know, this, uh, hard working Indian postdoc, and then I asked him to work on the system. Actually, the recipe was already there. Uh, Raymond Black you know, this, you know, this outlined what I had to do. Actually, my postdoc followed it through and discovered something he reported and something he didn't. And that was actually the beginning. And immediately I asked him to peel the sample using scotch tape and put them on top of our you know, so left, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, page of our, our institute. I worked back then. And the sample become transparent. And it, it was a clear sign that this idea worked. But that was the only beginning of a whole horrible, you know, it's a terrible journey because I cannot use neutron. I cannot use a magnetometer, no septometer. Uh, you know, it's basically, I have sample now, and then I didn't have any tool I can use to, to do whatever. And, and that brought us some of, you know, it's, it's a very uh, hard time, but in the end, we found that optical measurement was the best tool. And using optical tools, we were able to produce monolayer of these and factorize samples. And I'll come back to this point. But then a year later, group in US produced ferromagnetic monolayer, and, and that was basically the beginning of the whole thing. Since then, there has been numerous reports of new materials starting from TMTXD and Another sample we reported last year on quartan and so far. So that every year we, we see the new compound. And the compound highlighted in yellow came from my groups. And not as drastic as what Paulo said about Moares, but at least that we see that there is huge increase of interest in this particular class of material. And some of them probably you know, uh, I'm going to cover today. And the other point which I'd like to actually mention because someone asked me about the lattice. So in two, two dimensions, you, you basically have three kinds of the lattice. One is honeycombs, another is square, and then triangle lattice. You can actually realize all three compounds. And, and, and so whatever game you might have in your mind, you can now do using your input. Another point I have to emphasize is a lot of these systems, because this highlight, they are very, very air sensitive. For example, one of the famous ferromagnetic compounds, chromium iodine 3. If you expose sample within a minute, basic sample melt. Okay, this is terrible. So one of the, the big emphasis in my group is discovering air stable material. Luckily, this can be actually the air stable and these two compounds, chromium PS4, we discovered a couple of years ago and one from Columbia. And these are the extremely air stable, although you, know, it's, it's, you still have to keep samples relatively in uh, uh, good conditions. And the other compound we discovered, they are all again uh, air stable. So this actually uh, gives more <laughs> degree freedom for application. Yeah. Are you mostly hydrogen system? Or... No, the, I, I come to that point. So actually, you can realize the all three systems, Ising, XY, and Ising. Do you have any idea of why those two are air stable? Uh, I can answer you very uh, easily for this MPX3. So uh, X sulfur, sulfur is actually very, very stable element. Okay. And phosphorus again, and transition metal. Iron is sometimes very easy, oxide, but manga, nickel, relatively slow. And we even actually monitor how iron oxidize in the air. It, 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 it takes, you know, it's, it's about an hour. Uh, for selenium, tellurium, and halide, they are very reactive to the air moisture. Okay, this is well known in chemistry. So, so that's that's the reason. Okay, thanks. Okay, yeah. There are, yeah, so, so. So there is a cleavage energy uh, density. Uh, 
I, I know people can calculate, but in our group, uh, it will depend on whether you can actually, you know, it's, it's uh, exported by scotch tape or you have to do some, you know, special technique. Uh, it, 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 some of them, uh, like, you know, these are materials uh, and also chrome iodine C, these are quite easily exploited, uh, you know, and you extract it. Uh, but iron, germanium, tellurium, two, also mangan, uh, this material and four, they are uh, not that easy. So you need some special, you know, technique. But I know, you know, there are groups already, you know, have that technique. We also have, so, you know, it's not that hard actually. Did I answer your questions? Uh, so, the, one of the big challenges I had uh, working in this uh, particular, you know, is uh, physics word, right? True. Okay. So when I was working on this compound, I already spent almost more than 20 years of my career doing neutron scattering day and night. <laughs> Wrote many proposals to ISIS, ILL, and sometimes rejected and accepted. I came to UK through Hisro and, you know, so did a lot of experiments. And, and, and these are useless now. There is no way you can use neutron. <laughs> and if there is ever, you know, never, you know, any possibility. Uh, and the other actually anti-climax <laughs> from my training at Intel was, uh, although there are beautiful, you know, very strong optic groups, but at least in, in ninth floor in, in, in Peru Kali, which where we occupy, so to say, experiment, there is kind of an air that, you know, this optic tools are useless for magnets, for example. So in those days, you know, it's, it's, uh, we never heard about Raman's Aya, whatever. I mean, there are four phonons, right? Okay. But I was lucky to have, you know, it's a good friend uh, in, in Korea, uh, had been doing a lot of Raman's. Uh, I wasn't quite sure how, man, how Raman will be useful for, for my sort of study, but at least I knew that Raman is very sensitive to the moon layer. So one day I convinced him that, you know, I have to look at my sample under the microscope of his. Um, and tool, he joked, you know, he's never, he never measured any magnetic material. And he, he couldn't believe you know, if there is any real chance uh, uh, of you know, this positive result. But I was uh, lucky. So these ion PS3, which is ion material. And when we measure the bulk sample and cool the sample down, you see that there is a strong phonon peak. But there is a phonon at very low energy, which Originally very broad and then become split at low energy depth. Okay? And this is kind of circumstantial evidence. And, and we, 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 we try to analyze, quantify this parameter splitting at functional temperature. And we, we could see that uh, it actually could continue all the parameters. Okay? And the simple reason is you have strong magnetic friction. Uh, I'll come to that point. Somehow, in these 2D materials, you have extremely large magnetic friction or magnetophonon coupling. Okay. I was lucky. And after I, our work, people at NIS, Angela with Walker, she measured the Raman and, and focused on this particular energy scale because initially we saw these are the four desired phonons. And that was uh, our interpretation. But when she measured these uh, ultra low energy Raman peaks up to nine Tesla, she found that one more the split, basically following Chiman splitting. And that's clear sign that it's a single magnet. Again, going back to my training at Imperial early 90s, and we never thought Raman can measure at a single magnet. We knew that Raman sometimes can measure two magnet, but not single magnet. But it was clear sign that you can do. Not only that, a uh, group from Grenoble, uh, there is high field lab, uh, and actually it's done in Toulouse, uh, measured right up to 34 Tesla, and they found that actually these, the, the uh, so Angela Hauser measured up to nine Tesla, and they went rank of the field up to say 15 Tesla. They see that actually there is an anti-avoid crossing, which basically means these are magnons, with anti-crossing with phonons. And so there is a, you know, it's, it's superposition of phonons and magnons. I don't know how much you're excited about this. Actually, I was. Because I, I spent my career doing uh, multiferic a lot. 
And, and multispheroics are basically about the coupling between magnetic degree of freedom and the charge degree of freedom dipole. Okay? And there are DM terms, but the other sort of thing is it plausible, at least more interesting to me was actually magnetic friction. Okay? Magnetic friction always been coupled to magnetic phonon, right? Okay? And that idea is not that new, actually. Even Charles Kitter wrote the paper in 1958. The only thing we did actually in other group did was after Charles Kitter's paper, there is no experiment following his idea. I guess there's more about experimental units you know, problem rather than theory. So what we did and, and other group did was actually two the one particular compound hexagonal mangana, which is two dimensional hex you know, triangle lattice. Again, this is a you know it's a covalent bond you, you never be able to cleave. Uh, we we went through the all sorts of neutron and, and X-ray scattering, measuring basically individual magnet and phonon. And in the end of the day, we constructed 96 by 96 magnet and phonon full spectrum and numerically diagonalize and estimate uh, sort of in a magnet and phonon coupling constant dimensionless number. Actually, as it's uh, done in, in, in our latest work and there is a review. And there was actually high <laughs> point for my career. You know, we can give the number for one, one particular physics for each compound. So if you ask me what compound has a, how much of magnetic phonon coupling, I can give you a number. We started from one to the highest number we had was 15, uh, which is basically you know, this uh, sort of grunitian parameter uh, of you know, this uh, Tetris chemistry. The only problem was these are done on case space, momentum and energy space. So such so momentum and energy space, you see that magnetic phonon coupling. Beauty about this is you see that in zone center. Okay, you see the zone center, and there is a lot of the game you can play around in you know, a mixing between magnetic and phonon, right? Uh, I guess you know, so using microwave, you can easily convert magnetic to phonon, phonon back, back and forth. Can you give us an idea of where it's coming from? I mean, the naive. Coupling, as you mentioned before, is two magnons to phonons, yeah. S dot S couples to U yeah. I J. Yeah. So what is this in orbit driven? What, what's the nature of the coupling? Uh, so it, that's very, very good question. Actually, the original Charles Kittel model is based on collinear. Okay. The mm -hmm. so collinear having you know sort of in you know, is extended friction, then you can vary vary the J. Okay. Mm -hmm. But what we found in, in the series of work is if you have non collinear. Then non collinear basically allow you to couple to single magnet and single phonon. Mm -hmm. So basically, if you have transverse component, then you can couple to the phonon. Mm -hmm. And that was basically the game. And usually, if you have collinear, then that magnet and phonon coupling is less favorable. But for non collinear, yes. ideally, you can have that phonon magnet coupling. Why it's so strong on 2D? That's another another question. I, I, I guess so that's probably some interesting theory. Uh, so using this material, uh, we basically uh, tried to, you know, this in a test uh, a theory basically. For the case of ID, you can come down to you know, is uh, uh, so these data was collected the mono layers, and if you when you believe me that all the parameter we collect the monolayer right up to 51 nanometer is exactly the same. Collect on top of another. And so basically proof of you know, this on sub solution. And we measured the you know, X1 equal PSC, and we found that all the moment is stable down to bilayer, but monolayer is gone. Okay, again, consistent or not inconsistent with big expansion. I'll come to that point. And the case of Manga PS3 fluctuation more strong, therefore you lose all the parameter earlier than, than anything else. Uh, so these work we did on, on IMPS, the iodine class of monolayer was uh, extremely important for me because this is verified my original equation and intention, it works. And also, as I said, uh, two groups, actually four groups in US confirm that you can do the something similar on ferromagnetic. Advantage of working with ferromagnetic material, there is a mock technique. Uh, again, I never heard about mock when I was student at Imperial. I guess that's probably, I don't know what, you know, this uh, in early days, you know, it's magnetic all four neutrons, right? Not even actually back then. But mock, you can, you can, you can, you have more sensitivity, 
and you can do this spatial mapping. Uh, you, you can do the micro ramen too, but at least that was at least sorry, a couple of years ago. So the sort of summary of, of it, my initial question about uh, sort of you know, all the parameter or, or you know, model Hamiltonian, basically I think I have now very satisfied. We have very clear experimental data. Everything is considered with theory. So not surprising, right, okay? Is it end of the game? No, I don't think so. Uh, so Tony Leggett uh, in 2013 claimed that uh, he actually uh, meant X Y model Hamiltonian more than anything else. He meant, he he, is, he claimed that no single experimental setup allows us to measure both static or the parameter and dynamics. Okay, helium three, so certain zones or whatever. They usually fall static, and and, and what we uh, found is now we have possibility of measuring these dynamics, and I come to that point. Okay, these. A uh, window of opportunity in you know, inserting dynamics for say XY model. I think this is going to be extremely interesting. And at least within the circle I spoke, uh, who have been studying XY model, no one uh, gave me sufficiently uh, good answer which direction we have to push. But I I, I come to that. So with that, let me uh, dive into our main topic, which is. Uh, Secondly, band magnet already, I already mentioned that, but there are some things which I like to talk to, and that's strong correlation and magnetic excitation. Yes. Maybe I missed this question. Can you get the particle exponents? Yeah, you can. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And so then, uh, can you understand B? Are there, is there any possibility of doing uh, it in sort of regular lattices or random lattices? Uh, that's quite an interesting question. So let me, let me uh, answer. You asked two questions. Okay. Number one, uh, measuring critical exponent, we can do, uh, but you have to know this. This is again, this is top secret. Uh, to do proper critical exponent analysis, you have to go to very narrow range of reduced temperature. Okay, people usually, uh, you know, it's, it's a plot, you know, it's a critical exponent uh, of a few, few Kelvin scale, and say this is consistent with 3D, 2D, X, Y, whatever. Okay, I think that is. Extremely misleading. If you really follow the work done in the 70s by Bodinos group and others up the United States, Kenneth Wilson's in a theory paper, they actually measure all the parameter in, in, in the very, very small scale with your temperature. Often you have to measure down to you know, 10 to the minus fourth or up to 10 to the minus one. That is a window you 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 can have reliable the exponent, okay? That much work has not been done on, on this in you know, its class of material you can do, but that basically means a lot of unit you know, Okay. But you if you read the paper, they'll often measure in you know, the you know, all the parameter and, and claim the you know, this is not inconsistent with things. And that doesn't mean that you know there are something exciting. And I also mentioned that uh, at the end at the uh, in the middle of my talk. And then you ask about disorder. Uh, so I don't know how many of you will be excited by this statement. Is a spin glass stable or monolayer? This is actually a very important question because Brian calls coined the spin glass. When I came to his lab, everyone was talking about spin glass. Okay, there is an intellectual question: Is a spin glass stable or monolayer? This spin glass is basically quite disordered. Okay, <clears throat> we have a sample. We have a sample. We measure. We have some tantalizing evidence, and 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 the only problem is, you know, is uh, if you see the data in believer eye, uh, in its eye of lip, then you can trust. But if you really, you know, is, is put that data, you know, is, uh, under the eyes of hostile referee, I don't think we can <laughs> actually apply. But I think this is very interesting, uh, you know, is this uh, question: Is spin glass a stable or monolayer? We have a system, we measure, we really like to push that. But the, uh, again, you know, there is some experimental units, you know, it's uh, different, right? Yeah. Yeah, just a couple of questions. First, is it, is is it, it, sta is it stable? What's, Which one? What's the answer? Uh, spin glass is stable. It's stable. Yeah. So the, the 
my group is, is uh, has strong emphasis on stable material because then we have more handle. You know, it's uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so, what do you put in these on? What's your substrate? Uh, so there are many substrates in use. Typical substrate is, is silicon, silicon dioxide. But we, we use different you know, this, uh, <laughs> metallic substrate and, and, and also even you know, this, uh, better substrate for some reason or another. So in principle, you can, you can, you can produce more layer on different types. I'm just wondering if, because you said disorder, the substrate can create disorder too, right? SiO2 is pretty disordered. Uh, <laughs> Electronically, at least. So. I think actually interesting that we are working on uh, SPO substrate at the moment. So uh, again, I think that's an extremely important question. You know, how much is in a substrate and actually in effect of how we measure. Mm -hmm. But the spin glass material I'm talking about is actually monolayer spin glass. So actually, let me clarify. So we, ha we have bulk spin glass. We can peel the sample down to monolayer. We track the sample with signal down to monolayer uh, or the parameter, and we see that signal is stable, that monolayer. Uh, but you know, when it goes down, first of all, spin glass is, is weak phase transition, and it goes monolayer, signal is, is tremendously suppressed. So you know, there is some argument, you know, is it real, real data? Oh, we are somehow you know, it's, it's, uh, fooled by you know, this error. But I think there is a Intellectually, it's very interesting question. Experimentally, this is very challenging uh, work. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you know, do you have nearest neighbor interaction? So there, actually, my tenure at, at, at the under Brian course in a come in positive way. We have completely handled about Hamiltonian, so we know the parameter extremely well. So I come to that point. We actually measure a system on the neutron, so we 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 clarify the Hamiltonian for us. And so to short answer to your question is, uh, honeycomb lattice you always have J one J three important, often J three. You can be neutrons on this. Oh, the bulk, not monolayer, bulk. Okay, but I was wondering how the layer normally, of course, you get neutrons. Yeah. I wasn't clear how you got it. So there is a, a big gap in, in my logic. So we measure bulk. We, we have clear idea what spin Hamilton we, we have for the system. Big gap is we assume that spin Hamiltonian is correct on the monolayer, mm -hmm. even on top of substrate. Surely that is not going to correct, right? Okay, but that's uh, that that is much that we can do. Uh, but I think uh, if you have boring substrate like silicon, silicon oxide, I don't know whether it's really boring. At least we can assume that is correct. And a lot of our experiment is consistent with, with that. But if we have some more exotic, you know, say uh, substrates, that's for instance titanium oxide, which is quantum paraelectric, then things are quite complicated. Right, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When you said about the spin glass being stable, were you talking about structural stability? No, we were talking about whether you have a spin glass transition. Yeah, in them? yeah, the later, the latter. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And this is uh, Ising, uh, So that's another interesting question. So the the spin glass, you can you, you basically have to have disorder in okay. frustration. Yeah. Uh, so there are two kinds of disorder you can produce. One is you have you know this. Uh, you have ising and then you have disorder, chemical non negative dog and substrate. That's what you can do. The other one is you have different types of units, you know, magnetic nitro. Okay? Mm -hmm. We work with the second option. Uh, that it turns out easier for us. Okay? And I think the you know, see, for, for formal cases, it's probably true. The only problem is so this is again in its completely different scales of game. So we we'll only make a sample and to you know, talking or, or alloying, okay? Mm -hmm. We assume the sample is homogeneous. Uh, but what we found in these compound is, actually that's not correct. If you measure sample on top of microscope on the scale of you know, this uh, micron you know, variation, you see that a lot of sample actually in, in homogeneous. So the important point is you having extremely homogeneous sample under the, on the scale of micron and measure. 
actually we we we, we initial our, our initial attempt on screen glass actually you know, failed terribly for the sampling. Uh, that's a million dollar question. I think ideally you like to measure non susceptibility. Okay, that's that's the cool, cool, that typical non techniques. But of course, you cannot do. I, if I have a speed magnetometer and, and try to measure that, I may be able to do. But currently, we're relying on the Ramas and also second arm generation. Uh, Can you see the uh, uh, unfortunately, we come very frequent there. Yeah, that's another sort of, but again, I'm assuming that uh, in the book, we characterize sample extremely well using AC stability and even diffuse scattering, diffuse, neutron diffuse scattering, and see that actually there is a, you know, this uh, green glass evidence. Okay? And assuming that if I peel the sample down monolayer, that phase is stable. And, and then we measure. And, and then when we measure the you know, Raman and second harmonic generation throughout the whole process, we see that they are there, uh, basically in state. But yeah. Uh, another question is you seem to have an Edwards Anderson screen glass full screen. Mm -hmm. And so there was some, my work by um, David Kingsland and Daniel Fisher mm -hmm. about droplets in this kind of thing. Yeah. Is it possible to access that? Uh, not with our sample, though. Uh, I think for that, you probably like to work with uh, metallic in its undervirus monolayer. Yeah. But that yeah. would be something that we I think in, in principle can be done. So because you you, you guys are interested in that question, the trouble with this kind of is this line of attack is that there isn't enough motivation for people like us to work on. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we I'm excited about this thing last because my connection is Brian calls and is that it's kind of intellectual heritage. But if people really you know think about this important this problem, I think people you know experimental will be you know, this uh, uh, you know, it's hard push to, to address this problem. Uh, okay. Yeah, but they, yeah. So nickel PSV, it's very simple. Uh, if you, there is various ways of making sample. I'm not going to tell you much, but there is a defect issue. Uh, so how how you control the defect? So this sample is drawn by typically CVT chemical vapor transport is prone to have defect. Okay? Most of the experiment is not that sensitive to defect, but there are. Okay, so you know, it's, it's really uh, have problem which is sensitive to defect, especially if you work on, on some very exotic phase, I think defect can be very problem. But at least uh, throughout my talk, you know, it's, it's, I'm going to assume that all the problem I'm like, I like to ask is not that you know, it's, it's sensitive to the defect. Uh, sometimes we do, then we have to develop the you know, it's, uh, different method and, and, and that's the actually quite different job. Uh, so the, I have to give credit uh, for <laughs> earlier work on this particular compound after Raymond Brett, which is actually Trevor Hicks in Australia. In Monash, uh, Trevor Hicks is retired now. He's uh, one of the uh, you know, he's a legendary Australian neutron scatterer. And he produced uh, many talented students. And Trevor Hicks group has a long history of studying these kind of materials. And one of his probably last year, actually not last, one before, uh, is Andrew Weiss is working at ILL. Andrew's thesis is actually on this compound, nickel, ion, PSD, bulk, neutron scattering. So Andrew has a long history of working on this compound. He does, actually. So this is actually basically some of his work done with Trevor Hicks uh, using Dim9 ILL. And, and, and they done beautiful uh, neutron diffraction experiment in down the magnetic moment. And the magnetic moment of nickel PSC actually on the uh, AB plane along the A axis, and this is one quite important, but canting a little bit above 15 degree. And why this canting occur, we do not know. There is a guess that there may be DM interactions, but as you know, in a honeycomb, you can have second order dictionaries, neighbor DM always. Uh, no one actually be able to handle that physics yet because Hamiltonian we have is already complex. I'll come to that point. The other point I mentioned is ordering temperature is very high and sample is very stable. Uh, and the, the moment uh, is uh, almost 50% of the ideal ionic value. Uh, you know, it's, it's, this is mystery, at least uh, when Andrew uh, did PhD, and we now know why. Uh, 
And so there are two, actually, probably three or four group working uh, uh, on the uh, spin dynamics of bulk. Actually, uh, so I work with Alan Tannan, and, and the, there was some motivation for us, uh, 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 quite different from Alan, uh, Andrew Weiss. So Andrew's paper was published, and we submit our papers. And basically, the, the data policy is about the same. And the bottom line is uh, you have actually Hamiltonian, uh, Heisenberg, and then uh, single plane anisotropy, single axis anisotropy, and you have to have this many, uh, you know, so it's a prompt. Okay. Important point is you have always a large JCD, and this seems to be very crucial for honeycomb magnet. And somehow JC is very strong. And so basically, simple line, uh, simplified Hamiltonian will be J1J3. And you have, you know, these uh, magnetic monotropy uh, to stabilize magnetic moment. And the, the, the caveat with this uh, model Hamiltonian is you cannot stabilize canted magnetic cell. And so there is something which we have to, and I think I did DM. The only problem is uh, Hamiltonian is already complicated, and adding DM is, is uh, another issue. So remember, the, these J's are quite strong in play. Uh, and we don't really care about interplane, but interplane in fact, is, is uh, uh, much smaller. Uh, so here, J4 is there. And then you have a small magnetic analysis. Uh, one interesting point about this system is, uh, as I said, my original goal was uh, having system realizing more physics on 2D using magnet. Okay? And the evidence of that is actually found in this optical measurement. So these are the optical measurements on the three compound. And you see that all the optical conductivity measured from 400 down to 10K have a extremely large size uh, uh, spectral transport. And especially in this nickel PSC, you see that spectral transport occurred order about 6 EV, although we only pull sample from 400 to 10K. And this taken as evidence of a multiple. So we now know that multi physics in here is important. And the only problem is we cannot measure monolayer sample, which will be extremely interesting. So let me just uh, you know, say uh, same, something more about this uh, multi physics in nickel PSD. And if I uh, zoom in the, the particular you know, peaks and, and plot as a, as a you know, say it's a functional temperature and take derivative, then you see there is a sign of you know, say it's, uh, uh, anomalies and that anomaly is consistent with you know this uh, uh, tunnel and this sign this is a sign of uh, coupling between spin and charge degree freedom often taken as a sign evidence of motivics in oxide including field brain. Uh, so let me go back to my earlier mistake uh, you know, underestimate important drama. Uh, we now know why uh, so Conventional Raman uh, study done mostly on, on phonon uh, or, or superconductivity, not much on magnetism. For this compound, uh, somehow there is a uh, some kind of you know, this region why we can see these things. These nickel PSC, if you see that uh, room temperature and base temperature, you see that there is a broad peak, very extremely broad peak. This is two magnetic continuum. And which is not that terribly in its right, but at least if you compare with INPSC, which is the I think, then you see that there's nothing of to never continue. This is very unique for 2D. And the, as I said, uh, these uh, materials have often very strong in you know, a like coupling or magnum phonon coupling. And, and what particular phonons is sensitive to that coupling is still unknown. We, we, we just measure and see and trying to rationalize our idea for ion PSD, as I said, this P1 is more important. Uh, for nickel PSD, it's P2, although both share the exact same crystal structure. Okay. And the, uh, if I zoom in a little bit more, then you see the clear signs of you know, the peak splitting. At room temperature, you have two more degenerate. At the magnetic order, you, you, you get split. The reason is, these uh the, the phonon is actually in plane mode, this AG mode and BG mode are almost degenerate at paramount state because it doesn't count actually which direction you vibrate. But once you go under the order of phase, then 
reaction of you know, displacement with respect to the spin reaction, obviously, is not going to the same. Therefore, slight shift of the form, and that's what we measure. And if you follow that, that is uh, basically all the parameters. That's how we do. Uh, so if you further you know, this, uh, focus on, on thin sample, which is uh, here. So if you measure this particular monolayer sample, uh, and, and you see that down to monolayer, you see that uh, all the parameters disappear. Okay. And this is signs of you know, this null data. And, and for experimental, this is horrible, horrible situation. You know, if you have negative sign, there can be anything from you know, it's a mistaken experiment or whatever, right? Okay. Uh, we spend uh, many hours of you know, our experiment time uh, and convince ourselves this is true. Then we realize there is something going strange going on. That is, I told you these broad peaks are two mega, okay? If I leave this data, then the order parameter is gone. Okay, consistent with BKT transition. Okay, but there is still one interesting physics, BKT trends. Okay. And I claim that we have something very unique to Megano continuum monolith. Okay. We couldn't actually argue that much on this paper because the paper was rejected in another journal and, and referee didn't like that. And, and he had is too speculative, and, and so we we basically had you know passing comments on that. But we know this is seen all our sample. And it's not just in this is uh, something to do with our instrumental sample. Every monoway sample showed evidence of broad excitation, which we think is something to do with uh, uh, two megahertz. So here is the analogy. So you have a strings okay, or, or or drums, okay, and you. You can see the you know, the music, but you can also hear the music. Okay, you see the music because strings vibrate or drums vibrate. Okay, you hear the sound that is excitation. Okay, the situation is here. You don't see the actual strings vibrate, but you still hear the sound. That's the analogy I made. Okay, I don't know whether it's consistent with our understanding with BKT trends. I don't know. I talked to a number of people in Korea. Uh, they couldn't help me, and thanks. Garden. Recent paper from again Grenoble uh, confirmed. Uh, sorry, actually, I'm not quite bad. This is Grenoble now. Confirmed our, 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 our data. So they basically uh, repeated what we did and went down to monolayer and found there is a strong evidence of two megahertz, okay, that they're confirming our data, okay. But they couldn't do much with this experimental data. So what they did was they did a DNFD uh, calculation and, and found that this particular trend we found 150 is actually BKT transition, at least from theory. So these are the experimental data and these are the theory. Okay. At least seem to be consistent, not that much different. But whether that is actually correct or not, I don't know. Here again. I guess comment comes in. This is a system which you can study dynamics. Okay, and we already studied dynamics. The only problem is whether you can believe this or not. Okay, and how to interpret, and, and moreover, how to elaborate these experimental tools. And, and so, I guess this is probably quite interesting uh, graph. The another interesting thing is, uh, I'm, I'm I'm doing more optic or trying to. Uh, I was waiting for you, like, like three days ago, you mentioned that the magnetic moment as measured in bulk neutron mm -hmm. was half of what yeah. it should be. Yeah. Are you going to comment on that? Or? Uh, I'll come come that point. It's a way for me to slide. I, I, I have slide. I will. Okay. okay. Thanks. Any, any questions? Oh, I, I, I think I can end it, right? <laughs> so the point is this. Uh, so remember that my Hamiltonian had two magnetic ionized rocks in plane is axis. So each of them is going to create megalon gap, okay? Uh, Raman data, we measured, it, it, you see that it's a very, very weak, but narrow height, kind of a 10 wave number, which is roughly about one millivolt, okay? That's robust, okay? That's very robust. And if you follow that and function temperature, then they follow more or less all the parameters, okay? We can't actually claim this is a spin gap, and this is, as much as we, we could do with the experiment. And, 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 and then the, uh, we measure down to monolayer. As I said, the monolayer doesn't have all the you know, moments. 
and that's done. But otherwise, you see that everywhere. Okay. Then we we we, we because we have the Hamiltonian, we can basically you know calculate John Center in its magnitudes, and we found that actually there is a uh, it's quite interesting point. Depending on different you know this gamma point, you see that gap on five eb and gap in one eb. So these are the actually gap on zero point zero one one. Okay. So at least that is a uh, you know say what we can do. The interesting part is this. So usually the Raman people uh, use tools you know this uh, polarization analysis, and phonon and and megonon usually uh, distinguish by doing parallel and cross polarization. Phonon is parallel, megonon is cross. It's going back to actually sixty eight paper by Florian London teams. And the problem is with our data is that, that doesn't work. So here is the data measured at a base temperature rotating sample. You see that even cross uh, geometry that won't be if it is actually disappear at certain angle comes back goes away like that. And and if you do the same thing on parallel, then you again certain angle you don't have that one millimeter to pick, but that you see that at etc. Et et and if you plot that and geometric angle, you see that. There is extremely complicated angular dependence of this polarization. And it surely require more than standard in London flurry schemes. And, and, and recently, the Natasha Hawkins has been working on similar problem for glucine trichloride. And, and I don't know whether her new work is going to work for our system, but at least experimentally, this is very, very uh, new data, and we don't know how it works. Uh, and, and, and more recently, uh, there is a lot of competitions. And I know this uh, work is on archive. It is, uh, came from Grenoble Group. And they measured the exact more or less same Ramans and found that, again, that one millivolt and five millivolt six, and they measure right up to 14 Tesla. Okay. They, they did a beautiful analysis. And I couldn't believe you know, it's, it's, it's uh, the data. Sorry, the, uh, not, I, I want to repeat the data uh, result analysis because we have Hamiltonian. So using our Hamiltonian, same Hamiltonian we uh, obtained from neutron scattering, using exactly the same Hamiltonian, the only adding g man terms, then we could reproduce. So data points are the experiment data point that we took from this paper, and we could follow there. Full analysis, but I have to tell their paper also use a certain certain mode formula uh, explain these things. But our data is based on Hamiltonian, and, and we know now number. <laughs> and, and and we even went further, and, and and we now know there is something going on about eleven Tesla, and, and throughout the field we have uniform rotation of the magnetic moment, and and eleven Tesla there is something very unusual going on spin stiffness, and I won't tell you more about that. Uh, this is probably my last point uh, on, on, on this uh, talk. Uh, nickel PS3, as I told you, this is more dangerous now. And the magnetic moment is about one bore magneton, half of that. Uh, when we did uh, the, uh, the initial uh, the, the PL experiment, and in, these are usually in a standard PL, and, and we somehow found a very strong peak about 1.5 dB. And initially it was a, you know, it's uh, discarded because it's just, people told us that it's must be impurity. Okay. But when we did the optical absorption, we found the uh, peak at the same energy, and there was another. And then I asked my collaborator to do high ratio in its PL, and we got the number and the resolution uh, goes down extremely small, and about 50k it become resolution limited. And the width of that peak is about 0.4 millimeters, much, much smaller than someone's location, and even smaller than nickel to impurity 10 times. Why? We don't know. We, we just said this is coherence. And this is hand waving ways of you know, this coherence. Right after our work, there was uh, two papers uh, came out and confirming this result. And they also, uh, I'll probably come to this, uh, this their, their result later. And to understand this problem, and the well, the I'm more familiar with elastic technique, so uh, I came to diamond now. This using X rays, 
And using the, uh, the you know, energy spinability, uh, we can actually probe different state of nickel. Okay? So if you do X-ray absorption, then you see that usual uh, peaks, uh, A peak we call, which probably nickel plus. But if you scan the energy, then you can have another shoulder, the oxide so-called D9-elbastic. It must oxide this D9-elbastic is weak because covalent bonding or charge transfer physics. But for our sample, charge transfer is very, very small. It's not zero. And so you have strong D9 L bar state and roughly about 40% for wave function, okay? So what we did was we tuned our energy to D9 L bar state, these tricks, and this is the data. So if you tune the energy and, and go into energy channel, then you see that there is strong K about 1.5 dB. That is pure and parallel phase. And because you are doing uh, RICs, uh, you can also measure magnons, which is consistent with our Hamiltonians. And the, the, here is uh, my answer to your question. What we know from other measurement is this. The X-ray absorption, first of all, uh, give us high transfer energy. And this is very interesting. High transfer energy we have is about 1 eV. Our original paper, we claim of 0.5 of what we now is 1 eV. In the moment, as I said, all the moment on, on nickel is uh, one. And actually, state answer to your question is this is now not, not, not the A, actually, we have 50% in the last day. So this is uh, another reason. More interesting point it is, at least, well, we, we don't have any experimental data yet. At least our DMFT, uh, DFT, uh, the collaborator, found that actually there is about 0.15 for magneton on surface side. If you do similar calculation measurement on oxide, you usually get about three or four times smaller than that number as in this moment. So this is very unusual. And then there is a strong charge couple, okay? So putting all together, uh, my theory collaborator, uh, Bo Myung Kim and Young Son from Korea Institute of Advanced Studies constructed the model which is way, way beyond my comprehension. Uh, so you see that there is a basically five you know, uh, terms, and then there are, I think, something like 10 parameters. Uh, Even basically in a quantum, you know, say, manual calculation, uh, it's pouring of, of something 36, you know, say, uh, thousand, uh, no, 360,000 Hilbert space. It's enormous. This is a limit of, of their competition and power. I have to, I, I, I was kept you know, told by them that these parameters is not free parameter. A lot of them are actually fixed because these are coming numbers. And, 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 and moreover, we have clear optical data where they can actually bend them. Okay. So these are the fixed and, and the, uh, so, well, I, I, I probably forget about these, uh, and these are the experimental data, and these are theory. And there is clear, uh, you know, it's a fixed and open five. And that was as much as we like to see. When we have this data, and, and, and from here, look at the border. This is actually something that we haven't actually thought that much. What happened is when you have all the, the you know, moment, okay, then this hopping from nickel to surface, surface to hop, is going to be spin dependent. Well, a priori, everything has spin dependent. Usually, they, they, there isn't much difference. But in this particular compound, there is a measurable or calculatable difference in popping energy. And what happened is uh, when they order, you have type of So it's this is spontaneous magnetic electric coupling. We believe this spontaneous magnetic electric coupling is the reason why we have such a strong spin charge coupling. Okay. And we haven't actually explored this physics much, but at least that's what we know. And the, the, the extremely useful uh, result from the calculation is we can probe the ground state, and that is found in the Jang Rice uh, triple state for the D9 Elba state. And then, interestingly, the external what we found in 1.5 is coming from another state, which is Jang Rice single state. So these external, is a transition between triplet, singlet, many body wave function. 
And after I work, I told you that you know, two group, one in, in Xi Ling's group in Boston and then Xia Dongxu in Washington, basically uh, did sim something similar result uh, experiment and they found, uh, confirmed that actually narrowness of you know, this uh, language actually. Xi Ling's paper claimed the 370 microreactor mode we said 400 so is uh, is very very small. Uh, uh, in in Boston uh, result case, uh, the they found that there is a strong field dependence. And in Shadong Su's papers, and he found that there is an axiom, but there is also some modulation. They interpret it as a phonon. So this is axiom phonon bound state. And we work with New at MIT have beautiful later oscillations, basically similar to what Xiaodong found. And this is clear signs of the strong external phonon bound state. It goes up to almost eighth order tensor. So this is extremely unusual case. And we also found that something similar externs on another nickel two plus, two plus which is nickel identical. So this is now we have second example. So it's fine. It's fine. Uh, and this is, I won't tell you much, uh, new Gettys group did pump and probe experiment. That the idea is once you have axon, if you break that axon through the you know it's pump and probe, and what grounds that you will get, and 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 what they found was so if you do the pump and probe at certain you know it's it's uh, you know, a time scale, you see that there is at least evidence of zero which is a metallic state, yet they still see the magnet antiferro magnet. So this is evidence that we have at least time transient anti-ferromagnetic metallic state or more <laughs> uh, I'll probably skip that one. Uh, so our look, uh, let me flash some idea. So there are several groups working in different directions. Obviously, Moare Banderas Magnet is extremely popular in the US, especially King Pharma, Jishan, and Xiaodong is working on that. We also did some of our work. And the Spintronics applications is, is another interesting interactions. And the coupling between external flight and magnum phonon is another interesting direction, obviously. And, and uh, there are also question of monolayer multiferocity and the negative charge transfer magnetism. Out of this is a uh, selfish interest, I uh, uh, highlight the two case. The idea is this. So nickel iodine 2 is known to be bulk multiferic. Uh, it's known from Yoshitokura's group. Uh, this is a typical unit you know, type 2 multiferic. Okay. The question is if you kill down sample term the monolayer, will you have a monolayer multiferic state? Okay, that's the obvious question. Uh, we hit the idea and did a measurement, and these are our data. So we, we measure the sample uh, for down CNC and, and and monolayer. <laughs> this is bound layer and one layer data is gone. Okay. Uh, I because I was so interested in this idea, I asked my collaborator, repeat the measurement and answer is same. No signal. And, and we, we basically uh published our paper in nano letters. And year later, uh the uh you kind of come in, did the measurement and, and claim that in their case, one layer is stable. If that is true, then it's, it's very exciting uh, uh, in its question. Just like spin glass is stable in monolayer, is a multiferally stable on monolayer? That's another you know, interesting intellectual question. Bigger question, I guess, is this. We are so familiar with oxide magnets here. Not this because in this super in this is, uh, developed in oxide communities. The problem is uh, the oxide, you're working with parameter range of the, and their charge transfer energy is often three to five. So all the nomenclature we are familiar with, so D8 and the you know, kappa two plus, nickel two plus, whatever, that is based on this regime. But the material we are working, charge and I even highlight, your charge transfer energy is often very small positive, if not negative, okay? And if you just draw the schematics uh, of, of you know, it's, it's uh, electron density, then you enter very, very bizarre state. And it actually was pointed out by the none other than Daniel Komsky and several other people, you know, this, uh, this negative charge transfer regime. And what you will expect in that regime or how much deeper 
compared with oxide is another question. At least our, our nickel PS3 indicate that you have an interesting angle uh, where these uh, small charge trans energy slaves, okay? In, in chemistry, they call it computation interaction. Uh, so basically, well, I'll probably skip that one. So the, my talk is based on the uh, very extensive network of collaborations and, and those names that I highlight is actually, you know, I, I mentioned that in my talk, but there is also work I haven't even mentioned, uh, but the, uh, last but not least, uh, a lot of my group members is actually the so unsung heroes, including some of former members. Uh, and, and the one particular person is and basically you see now he's moving to uh, Birmingham as a new faculty member. Uh, we said, I guess the, the, the message is these of Andras Megane is an extremely interesting uh, material from Megane's point of view. And the, the sort of <laughs> problem I have is two. One is experimental. You know, this technique I can use. Second is a more theoretical or intellectual question. We said, let me stop here. Thank you for your attention. Okay, time for a few more questions. Go ahead. So, co coming back to this issue of the value of the magnetic moment, mm. right? So, let me see if I understood what you were saying. Um, the, the reason why the magnetic moment is closer to one than to two volt magneton mm. is because there is magnetic moments on the surface, right? That's, but you were saying that uh, this comes out to be like 0 0.15 per sulfur in half yeah. of the yeah, very small. That would explain half of it, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so you have a reduction. And then so, the other yeah. half is what? Is well, it's just transfer or? So, so, so you're actually correct. So we still have, you know, say, Deficit of magnetic moment. And the sort of current you know, is, is understanding is, is uh, low dimension. You know, see, if you go to low dimension, you often see the reduction of magnetic moment. Okay. But, but see, to be frank with you, I don't know. You know see, so we haven't actually done the bookkeeping yet. You know, see, so how much of that coming to fluctuation? And as you said, we have seen this moment on the other side. Is it going to help us that we haven't done that, that type of smart? I mean, the other thing is you you guys rely a lot on a spin Hamiltonian that yeah. you are putting out of these days. And, and now, of course, uh, all this fitting depends on, on whether the spin is one or two, right? So, yeah. so uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah. That we use the order moment. Yeah, yeah, we use the order moment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, very interesting. I love it. Yeah. Very cool stuff. Yes, John. Can I just say that in your infrastructure and survey on 2D van der Waals yeah. magnets, there is one system which you didn't mention. Oh, oh yeah. That's two dimensional solid. Helium. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, what's what to play is the nuclear magnetism. You know what the Hamiltonian is. There's no um, spin orbit interaction. It's so terrible to think because uh, demonstrate both ferromagnetism. I'm very sorry. I could ease. Sorry, completely. To publicize that to the general audience. Right. Sorry for intruding. In that. No, that's okay. I, I, I will correct that. that. It's actually it, it's a terrible personal mistake because uh, we, we, when I was working in Grenoble, that next was uh, uh, Godfrey. Godfrey. Go, 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 go. Go, yeah. So I, I, I heard a lot about their work. So sorry. I, I correct that. Sorry. Thank you very much for your correction. So what is this again? Helium, helium 3? Two dimensional helium 3. Yeah. yeah. So on graphite. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And it's PCC theory, yeah. Okay. <laughs> you can talk about it. I was I will ask you, yes. Good <laughs> questions. You just say a, a little word about technological applications. Thanks. Oh, you're, you're sponsored by Samsung. Yeah. They're probably not <laughs> interested. Uh, so I when when I gave you my title, I deliberately gave a very vague title. Since I I since I didn't have time to think about what, what I have to give. Uh, and, and the so the original idea was I want to cover some of the spin transfer application, but I didn't because it is, is have some you know, coherence of, of the scenario. And so this is your asked the question. So these two D material uh, is has very special combination of the symmetry on on two D, the smallest sample we can have. Okay? And that combination, I, I'm pretty sure, is shared among some bulk material allow you to do some exotic manipulation of spin state, for example, current manipulation of spin state, which is actually what spin transfer time to do. 
but in their case, they're using inside converter and okay, whole angle. And ultimately, I, I guess they will come into spin over physics too. But what we found in our system, if you have one particular set of, of you know, say symmetry, then you can write down the principle of lambda Hamilton, sorry, the, the function, which allow you to have current have self in this spin of top. So it's not like you, you polarize spin and then do SPP. These are the unpolarized, you know, it's a new, you know, it's current. But when it, uh, you know, it's a, the flow through the sample, mm -hmm. given symmetry of sample allows select one particular direction of spin direction. This is cool part of, you know, it's a, you know, it's a symmetry. And if you use that one, then you can actually use novel types of spin running. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, basically current control spin state, which is you know the next generation of memory. Yeah. And right. what we do is not actually application that much. It is with providing some kind of unit you know, proof of principle unit you know, demonstration using new material. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I think we're finished for the morning. Thank you very much, Sejo. Yep. Sam, when do you recommend we come back? One and a half hours from the